my God, yeah, that's <laughs> bloody cold. We're, we're only two episodes, but, uh, but thanks, guys, for coming on because it is appreciated. I know everybody in this day and age, everyone's busy. We've got yeah. life, families, we've obviously got the music. Some of us have got cold, so uh, it's appreciated that you come on just to, to have a wee chat. And I let me pick your brains with regard to to music. So it's very much we we'll kind of cover everything. And uh, I know there's four of you in the band, so we've obviously got Chris on vocals, who's got a cold yeah. at the moment, yeah. and we've also got <laughs> Dale on drums, and we're missing is it Callum on bass and Jimmy on guitar? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Callum Callum is here tonight, but he he doesn't really do the podcast very much. He's just he's not yeah. really. What's the word? He's not. He doesn't forward facing, front facing. Yeah, he's kind of like the mysterious guy in the background. He's, he's yeah. one of the. He actually does more like the music production and stuff. He likes yeah. to do that side of it with it. That's all like the entrepreneurial ones. Aren't yeah, they? and then um, Jimmy's had to um, shoot off back home briefly, and then he's going to come back again. Um, so he can't be here either, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, that, that's fine. So I know that you are obviously from Milton Keynes, but is that where the four of you are actually from? I, oh. I am, so I was I was uh, born in Milton Keynes and then grew up there. Uh, I then, you know, moved around for uni and uh, worked abroad a bit and stuff like that as well. And I, I was born in Wolverhampton. Um, my parents moved around a lot when I was young and sort of lived in Shropshire, London, um, Hertfordshire, and then now I end up in Milton Keynes because my... Um, my first wife, she was from Milton Keynes, so we moved back there to have kids. So, how long ago was that? That's about fifteen years ago now. Okay, yeah, the Milton Keynes about fifteen years. Now, so. Yeah, the other oh. guys, um, yeah. Jimmy and Callum, live like on the outskirts of Milton Keynes, like still like a Milton Keynes postal code, but not in the city itself. And I right. think they've pretty much always lived, you know, around that kind of area. Um, oh. Jimmy's from. Uh, Leicestershire, isn't he, or something? Lincolnshire. Lincolnshire, that's yeah. right, yeah. We've, we've got the... We'll just joke and say we've got the, the, the best two of the four on the uh, podcast. Yeah. That's it's no bit, joke. It's, 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 it's true. It's, it's, it's fact. probably true, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'll just ask the questions and you can both answer uh, for yourselves. So, sure. going away back to the very start, um, for each of you, Chris and Dale, were you both into music from a very early age growing up? I, well, I'll speak for myself. Yeah, definitely. I um, I didn't actually start playing an instrument until I was about 15. But um, I was, yeah, I mean, I was just, I loved records, loved the charts, used to, used to record Top of the Pops on the telly back then and stuff. And yeah, you know, we, cassettes and stuff. And, <coughs> and uh, what about yourself, Dale? Yeah, I mean, my parents were like, massively into music and uh you know just like all the all the greats like queen aerosmith bon jovi david bowie t-rex like yeah just just loads of loads of bands and then my sister was you like jason donovan didn't you (laughs) (laughs) no i don't know if i've ever even heard any of um but anyway yeah my sister then got really into music but she was uh she was actually like a goth when she was like in her teenage sort of young adult uh, um, stage and and um, so I kind of got into a, like heavier stuff like System of a Down and then like uh, I don't know a bit of like Marilyn Manson and stuff she used to listen to uh, Cradle of Filth and stuff like that but I never really quite got into that stuff but yeah and then I, di- I didn't start playing drums till I was 13 um, so not super young um, but it just sort of it was at the right age where it like became like my teenage hobby where yeah, it was yeah, just like my stuff. entire life yeah. just rotated around that really so that was yeah, great. Yeah I mean a lot of the people that I've spoke to it seems to be when they were younger they were into music but it was always very much probably an influence from their parents you know their parents would play yeah. music in the house in the car and yeah. then most people I would imagine maybe these are probably the same that you hit your sort of 10, 11, 12 you hit your teenage years you go off to high school and you all of a sudden maybe discover your own type of music yeah. that you like yeah. from what you were brought up with with your parents and you discover your own sort of thing. Yeah, 100%. Well, I, think, I think for me it was um, when I got into songwriting, which was, I, w- I didn't really properly start songwriting until I was in my 20s. Um, 
but I'd I'd liked some of the bands um, when I was younger, but not really been into them properly when I was younger. Like I, obviously the Beatles, ran Beach Boys, all those sorts of bands, and yeah. and it wasn't until I got into songwriting that I suddenly went back to those bands and I sort of I, I suddenly re- they that opened up to me a lot more, like the songwriting ideas and stuff, and um, it was just interesting. Here's Sorry. a question for, for yourself. Then uh, we'll start with Deal. So you obviously picked up the drums when you were a teenager. Mm. What made you um, gravitate towards the drums? Because as you'll probably know, most people when they want to learn an instrument, probably a guitar is the most accessible instrument. Mm-hmm. And it's definitely affordable. You know, you can practice it quietly. Yeah. Drums are always an expense. <laughs> You, know, yeah. space, you can't practice them quietly. Most yeah. parents probably would not allow their children to have a drum kit. So, so what mm-hmm. was it that made you want to pick up the drums rather than the guitar? Well, what, what's funny is like looking back um, to like my earlier childhood. There's actually like school reports that say that you know, like in cooking class, for example, we would do like a little cooking class. We didn't have like a dedicated cooking class. I didn't go to some like crazy posh school or something but um, we would occasionally do like some cooking and and I would always apparently like make the you know make it into percussion like you like you see kids do but I was I'd I'd often do that apparently and there's quite a few I've got like these old school reports where it'd be like in maths today Dale just carried on tapping on the table and wouldn't actually do his work (laughs) Um, so I think it was it was within me like quite early even though I didn't know that Um, but the real turning point was when I when I was 13, I, I had a friend um, and I, I went to meet him up in like the music section of our school. And there was it was a small area, but there was like one room that had a, a drum kit. And it was the only drum kit on the whole of the in the whole of the school. And I could hear him playing or someone playing it. And I go into the room and he sat there playing it. And I just instantly knew like I want to be able to do that because it just seemed so cool to me. Um, yeah. I think I really looked up to that to that friend. Um, he was, uh, I think he was Canadian and he was just a bit different and he just like seemed quite, quite like a cool guy and everyone thought he was a cool guy. And I just think I just thought I want to be able to do that. Cause it just looked, I think I liked the physicality of it. I just liked that it looked quite, quite interesting. Like, you know, physically. Did you and get, from, from then it was just, yeah, that's it. Did, did you get drum lessons or, or are you self-taught? Yeah, I did. I did get some drum lessons. Um, yeah, and my parents to go to go back to your you know your other question in, in that way. Like my parents were really encouraging of me. Um, I haven't really spoken to them much about it uh, recently, but um, you know they were always really encouraging. And we were lucky enough that we had you know a garage where I could have a drum kit. Actually, my first drum kit was actually in the loft. It was a really small little like jazz kit. Um, so we kind of found ways to do it, and they were just yeah they were just happy happy for me to do it and up for it. I mean, we had definitely had some um, some pushback from the neighbours and stuff, but, you know, it was kind of expected and we just made it work and it was, and I think there wasn't even any, there was never even any kind of like, you know, that you're not going to be a drummer. Like, it was like, you you want to play drums, we're going to make, you know, we're going to make that happen for you. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was great. And, and Chris, um do you? I know you're obviously on vocals. Do you play another instrument as well? Yeah, I play guitar. Um, so, how did you gravitate towards the guitar? What made you want to want to pick up the guitar and learn it? Well, it was actually a friend of mine at school who's um, he used to. His name was Simon, and he used to. He had this little. I remember he had this little amp that he strapped to his belt. So that was that sort of the cool fashion thing at the time. Yeah. And he'd go around. He'd go around the the school, and people would put, like pay him. 50p or 20p to do a solo because he'd learned like Pink Floyd solos and yeah. you know at some dire straits were really big and stuff and he must have thought he was so cool getting paid he to was, do that he, and he made a few quid every lunchtime and go around and people say play this oh, no. and I thought I want to be like that guy he was so yeah. good and um, weirdly I started off wanting to I, and I got into Deep Purple and Led Zeppelin and all that sort of stuff and trying to learn those solos and that yeah. And then I and I realised actually that wasn't really my thing. I wanted to be able to write songs. That's what I really wanted to do. And that came out a bit later. I realised I I just seemed to have a need, like just urge, this desire to get songs written. That was my thing. And 
and the, the, the actual performance itself, like the, in, the clever guitar licks or impressive solos, became a lot less interesting at that point. It was more about getting the melodies right, the lyrical content right, the, you know, the structure, the arrangement, all that stuff became fascinating to me. Did, did you get guitar lessons as well, or are you self-taught? Yeah, I, I had a few along the way. I tend to find that I, I got bored of my teachers really quickly. It wasn't, it wasn't their fault. I mean, they would, I just remember um, I'd get a few lessons, and it all started to get a bit samey after that, and I thought, okay. I kind of, in my head, I sort of figured out what they were, what, where they were going with it, and it was really, for me, it was about just getting the technique right, because I realised once I got the fundamental techniques, it's like a building block, and if there was yeah. anything I needed to learn after that, I could go away and learn it, because I'd sort of got got most of the technique and stuff, and and uh, so yeah, I had a few lessons, but not not years and years. It's actually the singing is the thing that I've had most lessons on. I was going to ask, how, how did you get into singing, because a lot of people will shy away from singing, because a lot of singing is confidence as well as technique, but <laughs> uh, what you tend to find growing up is that there's got to be s someone has to sing, and it's whoever's yeah. brave enough in front of the microphone. Is that kind of what it was like for yourself? Well, when funnily enough, when I didn't before I had singing lessons, I was a very nervous singer, and I didn't have to control my voice. I had no technique, and I just I knew what, how I wanted it to sound, but I didn't know how to control it. Um, and so I start over the years. I had a few lessons, and um, more recently, I've been sort of. I just have lessons all the time now. There's always stuff to learn, and it, it never. It just. There's more and more to know, and there's more and more to think about. We we actually have a little bit of a joke, yeah. a running joke between me and the other guys, yeah. um, where <laughs> like it's quite often where Chris will come in uh, to a rehearsal and be like, "Guys, I've had a huge vocal breakthrough," <laughs> and we're like, "Oh, really? Another one?" Like it's like literally every rehearsal. And it's like, yep. it's going to change yeah. the game. It's like, you know, this and is it, the... But it does, though. It means I, I mean, can, yeah, there's yeah. always improvements, but it's, it's, like, it's and funny. I've, I've got this thing where I always write songs that I can't quite sing yet. So I have to go away and learn how to sing them. And it can take something that can take almost a year to get it, get it right, learn all the techniques. And but when I do it and, it, and it's like kind of finally get there, it's a real achievement. But mm. I don't know why I do that. I've always written songs that I can't sing. It's hilarious. <laughs> it's like... But you have the vision <laughs> for something yeah. and you just want to get yeah. it out of it. Yeah. Like, did you... Because did you like want to, even though you weren't confident in singing yeah. at the beginning, did you just feel like, I just want to get these ideas out there? Well, I was going to talk to get about them that. Heard. Yeah, I, mean, I think I just, just need to get the song out there. But actually, weirdly, what's happened is as I've got, I had more and more lessons and more and more practice, the idea of singing in front of people doesn't frighten me anymore. It's, um, I think what frightens me now is no one's going to turn up, that sort of thing. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, the idea of people won't just bother turn up to a gig or something. That's 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 what we sort of get frightened about. I think, yeah, these yeah. Days. It's it's not we all the, all the quite, effort and stuff. We're quite confident to. that that we'll win an audience over. So, that's that's not been a problem. Well, not to sound arrogant, but we we get we get you know we go down really well now. And we ask get asked back, and we we seem to have a good reputation. And people you know we've had lots of people come online, and we supported um, Space recently, and mm. then. And a few people after the show were just like, you know, yeah, these guys nailed it. They were great, that mm. sort of thing. So we're getting a lot of that sort of positive feedback now from performing live. So that's not the problem. It's just we need to, you know, playing in front of the crowds is, is the thing that we, we want to do more of. So. See, back when you were teenagers and you were just yeah. picking instruments, starting to learn them, who would you have said was your influences back then? Uh, well, for me, um, oh, well, I guess, I guess besides my mate who was walking around the school playing guitar so there's a guy called Simon Norton yeah, um, yeah I guess Dave Gilmore uh, Richie Blackmore um, Jimmy Page just the usual guys you know the big yeah. Carl, Carlos Santana and the story about that was that he was on tour when I was on a holiday and I was 16 years old and my uncle wouldn't let me go and watch him because he, he was babysitting me that, that holiday and I was and I nearly I nearly ran away to go and watch that gig but you know, it's, it was almost ended up in the fisty cuffs. He was so angry that I wanted to go and watch Carlos Santana, and he was saying, "Hey, but he's really old. Why do you want to go and watch him?" And I was like, "I don't give a shit. This guy's a guitar legend. Let me go and watch this guy." You know. What about yourself, Deal? Um, yeah, I mean, I was like when I first, you know, when I was a teenager getting into music, it, it was a lot of like sort of pop punk stuff, like Green Day, so Trey Cool, um, Blink One Eight Two with Travis Barker. And like Rage Against the Machine, uh, always been one of my favourite bands um, with uh, Brad Wilk, um, and um, as well like yeah, System of a Down. I forget the guy's 
name. It's like John uh, Damalvarian or something like that. I forget exactly yeah. the pronunciation. But yeah, like guys like that, basically, like quite quite fast paced, like generally, and um, you know, quite upbeat um, kind of stuff, energetic stuff. Um, used to sort of you know tick tick the boxes for me. Um, when I got a little bit older, um, when I went to uni and stuff like that, I used to get a little bit more fancy with it and like um, it was like David Garibaldi from um, the band Tower of Power that were like around in the 70s and 80s and stuff um, but yeah just um, I just always go back to that I mean even like with, with Weston as well it's hard for me to to not want like to make a song like feel a bit pop punky kind of upbeat and energetic because yeah. that's what I gravitate to um, yeah so before we talk about the band we'll, we'll maybe embarrass yourselves a little bit so going back do you both remember the very first music album that you bought with your own money oh god <laughs> i actually don't remember the first one i bought myself i i do remember buying um i remember buying a, like a rage against the machine album um but i think that was i'd already had quite a few albums by that point Oh, I remember buying Toxicity by System of a Down. So I remember being a little bit into um, the System of a Down, like, self-titled album. And then yeah. Toxicity came out, and I remember going to Virgin Megastores when that was still a thing, um, to go and, and you could go and listen to CDs and, like, request to put them on the thing. And, yeah, I remember buying that, and we went. I went back to my friend's house, and we just sat and listened to it. Um, and, you know, we don't... I don't do that nowadays. I, I loved that. That was great. But... Yeah, I think that was one of the one of those around that sort of time was probably one of my first that I actually bought with my own money. I remember buying well, singles, but sorry, go on. Yeah. I was going to say, what about yourself, Chris? I think I remember the first single I bought was probably um, Adam and the Ants, uh, Prince Charming. Oh, what a tune! <laughs> yeah, that's cool. That's we actually cool. did a song. Sorry, I'm going to yeah. I'm going to talk about the band a little bit. Yeah. We yeah. actually did a song today where. It's um, it's actually got like a kind of a weird like medieval kind of vibe to it. Oh, it's yeah, hard, yeah. kind of hard to explain. Um, it's called "I Won't Blame Me." Um, so, but you know, we're not going to release it for quite some time, so people will have to wait. Yeah, but yeah. there's a lot of like overdubs that happen with the drums. So I did like several layers of drums, and okay. it really reminded me of Adam and the Ants because like some yeah. of those, yeah, you, really? like, wait until you hit Chris. Yeah. Chris didn't hear it because he had gone into the house. I had but... to go lie down. I was... <laughs> Not feeling crap. Right. Yeah, but I, I don't know if you know like any of their music, but they because they often had two drummers that would yeah. be playing at the same time, so they had the mm. lots of layers of stuff, and often one would be like tapping on the edge of the drum, on the rim of the drum, and yeah. one would be playing the drum, and we did a bit of a mixture of those things, and it just sounded <laughs> wicked. I, I can't wait, I can't for you wait to hear it. it. It's yeah. so good. Yeah, but, um, yeah. Was had on a few episodes ago, who who's a drummer as well, and. Yeah. I'd asked him, how did you get into drums? And he'd seen Adam and Nance on Top of the Pops. And, oh, two, wow. and that was what spurred him on to want to play the drums. I'm not surprised. Amazing. I mean, yeah, my dad was massively into them as well. Was he really? and, yeah, yeah. And that was a, a big influence for me early on. So. so, fast forwarding to obviously the band, the current band. Yeah. Uh, how, long is it, how long has the band been on the go, first of all? Uh, was it. Is it 2020? Was it 2020? We've been to, was it 2020, wasn't it? It was 2020, yeah. Like, because it was four it was, years this year. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was so August, I think August yeah. 2020. That's right, yeah. Um, so once lockdown had start, sort of, you know, sort of ended a little bit at that point and things had started to, people had started being able to do some stuff again. Yep. Um, Chris was looking for other musicians to, to get yeah, you know, well, involved with. Yeah, so basically, um, I've been doing the open mic circuit for about 10 years, and um, I, I've been doing my own solo project, and it, it was going all right, but it was a bit lonely, you know, and it was difficult to stay motivated, but it was just me on my own trying to do it, and I thought, I thought, well, if I put a band together, there'll be other people to work with, we can bounce off each other and keep each other going when, you know, time's hard. And I thought about all the people I'd met on the open mic circuit over the years, and, um, and I, and I tried to think of the people I thought I'd get on with, and so when I reached out to Dale, um, 
you were in, you were quite interested, weren't you? Yeah, like, yeah. He'd heard some of the stuff I'd done. I think he quite liked it. And we got together and had a couple of uh, little kind of rehearsals. That's um, right. Yeah, you, you, Chris had a couple of songs that he sort of had ready, but didn't have like drum parts and stuff. So yeah, yeah. Like, we sort of sat down and just jammed them out. And then, yeah, which and cool. then there was Callum, who I'd worked with before, but I'd also known him on the open mic circuit and stuff. And and then Jimmy, I'd met. Um, probably knew, knew, knew for the longest but funny enough he knocked us back to start with because he was too busy with his other projects at the time so he didn't actually join the band about a year later and we were still looking for a guitarist a year later and, um, and we, so we asked him again and the second time he said yes because his project had got a bit quiet so that was kind of lucky <laughs> really but he's such a good guitarist isn't he Jimmy he's incredible insane yeah. amazing <laughs> I, was, I was going to say I mean I assume that he's of all all four of you have probably played in previous bands over the years growing up. Um, so, I mean, playing in a band, as, as you know, all musicians have got egos and you've got band dynamics <laughs> that are yeah. difficult. So, within your actual band, and, and just for your opinion, how, how do you, th what makes the band work? As in, do you think you a band <laughs> needs a leader to well, steer the track? It's, it's, it's interesting because we've kind of we have sort of established our own roles and stuff, and that it's taken a while. But I think Dale's you're like the you're, he's like he's like the quite the silent manager, if you like. He doesn't sort of come out and say I'm the manager, but he, you sort of organise everything. He's like the really admin-y organised guy. He makes things happen. It's like there's often jokes about spreadsheets. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that, you know, my favourite thing to do is to get a, get the spreadsheet out or something. Yeah, it's amazing. And I'm I'm like I'm sort of like the driver, I guess. I like I, I like I write too many songs, really. That's the problem. And and I come to the rehearsal with like something like that, two or three songs, and the guys like slow down. You're, Chris. you're so. like a typical like ideas man. Yeah. Like in the business world as well, it's not just songs. Like Chris <laughs> is with the songs as well, but it's also like, hey guys, like what if we did this thing? Like we're gonna get a load of CDs. And we're gonna like, you know, give them out on the street for free, and but then we're gonna like get people. We're gonna drag people to a gig um, that's gonna happen like right on that day. Like, and it's like, what what's happening? Like, and we have to dial him back down again. Yeah, and so. when Jimmy Jimmy's like a really creative layer on top, isn't it? It's like you're, he like puts like the magical mel melodic stuff. I suppose. Yeah, he like, he's, he has like a vision for like the creative. Yeah, so him him and Cal they'll come thing. together and they'll produce the songs, but they'll also. They're very, they're very involved with the writing process. Well, we all are now. Mm. I'll come with like the seed of an idea, and we'll we'll just jam it around, won't we? Mm. Well, I was just about to ask there. How, how do you go about songwriting? So, is it yourself, Chris, that that comes in with a, a well, that, piece? That's what, that's what's that's worked. Yeah, that's what's happened. But it's like, I mean, every, I only want to just. I mean, it's funny that it's not as if no one else has actually c come to the rehearsal of a song. It's always been, I think it's just been assumed that I'm going to come to it with a song and everyone's going to just basically tear it apart and put it back together again. Mm. So I'm quite happy to have, you know, I'm not too precious about it. If someone says, I want to change this bit, I won't get upset about it. I go, all right, cool, let's try it and see what it sounds like. So you're, I think you're, you're coming in with a basic idea and then you're allowing everyone to contribute to that idea. Yeah, very much. I, 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 want, I want everyone to feel involved. I don't want it to feel like it's just me and... When I first, very first started the project, the band was called Chris Wesson. Well, it was me and my, if you like, and 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 musicians. Oh, cool. But then we just felt it wasn't right, and and we so I, I weirdly I, I didn't want to call it Wesson. It was it didn't feel it felt like a bit that was just a bit weird. But we had a manager at the time who thought Wesson was a good name, and there was someone else who thought Wesson was a good name. And the guys, you were quite you quite like the name. Yeah, I think I think it, I think it worked quite well, and I still do. Yeah, so. but I, st I always feel like you know it just feels like a bit egotistical calling it after my surname. But it, you got to name it something, and I yeah. think it works. And I thought it's you guys thought it was quite happy. catchy. Quite yeah. It, so. yeah, it's one of those ones that uh, the amount of bands that are, that I've known over the years that have probably split up before they even played their first gig because yeah. they fell out over the band name. They couldn't dis they couldn't agree <laughs> with the band. It was ridiculous. But um, I yeah. say. It, there can be so much thought put into it and then sometimes the best names are, are simply just a surname it, it works it might be a name that doesn't even mean anything that you know sometimes well, I, think, I think Dale's good. name's Dale's name's better than mine his, his name's Parker I think mean, it's a much better name for a band but there we are I do think that could be a cool name it's a really right? cool name but anyway but yeah so, Chris um, I was just going to say Chris does 
Like, that is really the setup. Like, and, and we've never even really explored, like, another way around of doing it. But be- I think because Chris... It works, doesn't it? Yeah, because Chris, like, is so prolific and just has so many songs. I think I'm so annoying prolific, really, aren't I? But you, al- <laughs> you also enjoy the fact that, that it's like, yeah. here you go, guys. Like, do something, like, what can you do with this? Well, I think, kind of I think it's like, it's what I, so I suppose what I bring to the band. Everyone brings their own thing. Yes. Yeah. Like, um, you know, in terms of... I mean, you you bring drums and your experience and all that sort of stuff. And Jimmy, mm. he's got he's basically a session guitarist, isn't he? He's yeah. that good. And and Callum's basically a session player too. Yeah. And and they bring that professionalism in their sector. Yeah. And for me, it's more like singer songwriter. That's what yeah. I bring to the party. So it's like I love doing like arrangements yeah. for songs. Like I love you know specific parts, like band phrases and collaborative moments and stuff like that. And like stops and you know hits and stabs and all that sort of stuff. I love all of that stuff, but I, I'm not very good at just like coming up with a random melody because yeah. I'm a drummer probably. But I'm also not very good at like coming up with random lyrics. I find I get too much in my own head. I'd be like, yeah. oh, well, what does that but mean? You are, but you say? are good at telling me when something doesn't make sense. Like if Dale doesn't like a lyric, he'll just say, what does that mean? And that, and I have to think about it. So actually, yeah, it doesn't mean anything. But well, go away, work on that again. So. I was going to ask, but with yourself being the singer, Chris, is it yourself yeah. who writes all the lyrics? I, I'll come up with the original ideas, like the concepts for the song and stuff. And what tends to happen is that the songs will change as we rehearse them more and more. It's like I'll start off with like a set of lyrics that kind of work, and sometimes if I'm not quite happy with the message behind a certain part, we'll have placeholder words that are like have got the right number of syllables and the right melody but they won't necessarily be the word that I want to use. And eventually, it's weird how it happens, but it's a very organic process. Eventually, the words sort of come out and fall into place, and then, then the song makes sense. But it's it's not... A, I try not to force it, because I think it has to be organic. It's got to be real. And and lyrics are so... I think lyrics are so important um, with a song. And if it doesn't feel right, if the lyrics don't feel right, it, it, it's that's a warning sign. Don't do it, you know? Just, just wait. Wait for the lyrics to feel right. And and I and I don't know about you, but I listen to so many songs and I just cringe and I think, what are they thinking? What are they singing about? It doesn't make any sense. I just don't like that. And, and and then every now and then you'll hear a gem and it'll be like, the lyrics are great. They're really on point. They're like they make complete sense. I can relate to that. I get I, get, I know where that guy was when he wrote that sort of thing. You know that that's just all that woman, whatever it is. And that's I'm not saying that I've achieved those heights, but that's 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 kind of like that's my inspiration. I want to write songs that I feel really. The lyrics are really kind of like make. I don't know. They just they're just real and they make sense. And, they, and I mm. I sort of want to be taken on that journey. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, Chris really does. He he does like ninety eight or ninety nine percent of the lyrics. Like the only the only lyrics we get involved in is just like little tweaks. Like Chris was saying before, it's just a little change here or there. Um, you know, and that's yeah, it. Really. But I also think you are quality control on lyrics because you guys will tell mm-hmm. me if you don't think it makes sense or you're not sure about it. Yeah, I think also like we get involved vocally a little bit, like Very rhythmically much so, yeah. and melodically. And, yeah, yeah and melodically, and but yeah. but yeah, in terms of lyrics, it's all yeah. Yeah, I was going to say lyrics are a, are a strange one because sometimes it depends on the on the type of music or the style of music. But uh, I mean, yeah. I remember I remember listening to uh, an interview with Noel Gallagher. And I, I can't remember what the song was he was talking about. It was an Oasis song, yeah. and he, was, he, he he wrote the song in ten minutes, mm-hmm. and that, that's a massive song, and no idea what the song's about. But he <laughs> said when he sings it, and fifty thousand people sing it back to him, yeah, yeah, yeah. he knows that it means something to them. He doesn't know what the song's about, but it means something to each person in, in the crowd. But here's a wee question then for you, Chris, with you being the, the main songwriter. See if I was to take the lyrics and read them without having heard the music. Yeah. Would, would the lyrics tell a story but that I could follow? Or, or is it a little bit more vague as in if 10 people read them, you get 10 different answers as to what the song was about? Uh, I'd like to think um, they're that it's easy to understand. Um, I, I, I was, you'd have to tell me, you'd have to look at our lyrics <laughs> and see what you think. But um, it, the idea is I try and write conversationally. I try to write as if it was me talking to you and how I would speak. That's, 
that's the sort of lyrics. But also, I think it's just got to be meaningful as well. It's got to be honest and meaningful and, and real, really. It's got to be like how I would speak, really. That's that's what I try to achieve. And trying to get that with a melody and the music at the same time, that's that's the art, really. That's the art form of trying to make it interesting. Yeah. I think, I think from my point of view, um, I feel like you skirt the line of it's like you know, because it's often about something real that's like a relationship or or an experience or, or a story that you've heard or something that's, you know, that you, you it's it's like a real situation that's happened or happening. Um, but I think it's like vague enough, the lyrics are vague enough that other people can, you know, take, take those, take that song or those lyrics into their own life. Yeah. Um, and and make it fit. I think, you know, yeah. Do you I know think what one, I mean? one way of saying it would be like, um, I'd be I'd be talking about a subject, and rather than saying, I I had to pay fifty pounds on my electricity meter, and I was going to run out of electricity in the house. I wouldn't put it like that. I'd probably put some say something like, um, um, and then the bills are piling up or something like yeah. that. Yeah, you know. So, so, so here's not, a question. Not, not being too specific. I think that's yeah, the right yeah. <laughs> So you're playing in a band, as everybody knows, playing in a band, the best part about it is playing gigs, right? Right. But do, do you enjoy the recording process? I think we love, love to record it. it. Yeah, love it, yeah. Love the recording process. It's like, how- coming here is one of the, it's like one of the best things that I've done in, you know, in my life generally, but, um, you know, especially in recent years, for sure. How do you go about recording as well? So, for example... Do you use, um, record the drums first and then do you use layer everything on top of it? Or do you use record it live and then do overdubs at the end? How, how do you go about recording what's comfortable for the band? So we do we do um, the drums, the bass guitar. Well, so the last, the previous two years when we came here, we did mm-hmm. the drums, rhythm guitar and the bass guitar all at the same time. Just so that the groove and everything was like really locked in. Um, and what we did is the drums were all recorded in the room, whereas the guitars were... DI'd, weren't they? Yeah, they were DI'd, so you couldn't actually audibly hear them, so they weren't interrupting with the drum kit, but they were being recorded at the same time, and they were locked in, and we could hear each other through our headphones. And um, and then Jimmy would then go and record the uh, lead guitar parts separately after the fact, because he then used the amps like loud and like incredibly loud like almost like shatter your skull loud um and i remember actually i went down there when he was recording it once and he had like four amps going at the same time and like it literally my brain i don't know if you've ever had this experience but it felt like an i can i can only imagine what it must feel like if an earthquake happens where your brain freaks out to the point where you're like i'm in danger but I don't know why, and there's something weird is happening. If it was like that, I felt like I needed to get out of there as soon as possible. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so he re- he, he'd he recorded the guitars there. Um, however, like this year, we're recording the the drums, the bass, the lead guitar, and the rhythm guitar at the same time. But we are still DIing their parts, and probably what will happen is that the guys often do a thing called reamping now where they will um, basically take the DI'd version of the, the recordings that they've done and put them through an amp and then record that. Um, so then that, that means that they can then do that at home and means we don't have to necessarily do it here. Well, I say home at Callum's. Callum's got a studio, yeah. recording studio, and, it's, yeah. and a shared out next to his house. So he's, yeah. he, we do a lot of the, a lot of the um, post-production stuff goes on at Callum's, yeah. basically. But it, it makes the you know the situation really flexible because they can reamp it as many times as they want and you know try different settings and it's not then set in stone. They can mess with it um, and try out different amps <coughs> and, and settings and well, stuff. Yeah, I mean just, they, yeah. They, they they ultimately they, they do produce the tracks though so yeah. between them. They Jimmy and Callum they and then they'll call me in to do redo the vocals and stuff typically. Yeah. I mean I'm a bit disappointed this time because I was hoping to maybe keep some of the vocals but my cold's fucked it all up. So I'm just doing guide vocals. <laughs> Are we allowed to swear? Sorry, we didn't check. Oh, yeah. I of think course. So. Yeah. <laughs> but um yeah but we got I mean, my voice is just about coping so I can hold the melody and the timing so the guys can use that as a reference. Yeah. But it's he's getting us through the songs which yeah, is we're the not, main we're not, thing. We're not gonna keep any of them. 
I hope they don't yeah. come out anywhere. That would be yeah. awful. <laughs> And then, and this kind of relates maybe to the bigger picture, but um, I, d I don't know what age you are, but, but years ago when I, when I first got my f first official recording equipment, it was a Tascam 4-track back, oh, when, I was, oh, back when I was 18, right? So it was, it was a long, long time ago, right? And as you'll, as you'll know, there was four tracks on it. Yeah, yeah. So sit in your bedroom, you'd start writing your songs and what you could do is you rec could record onto three of the tracks and bounce everything to the to the, the spare track yeah do more tracks and and, uh, and obviously you know over the years the recording equipment has became outstanding yeah. you know you can have pro tools you can have you know unlimited tracks if you wanted yeah. but do you think and this is maybe different for each of you the, inv the advancement in um, recording technology is it is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? Oh. Because I was always of the opinion. See, when you look at the old bands like the Beatles, the Doors, the Who, right? They were coming out late sixties, seventies. The technology, you know, it wasn't great, but what they lacked in te technology, they made probably had to make up for in creativity. Yeah, and if well, those bands were to come out today, there's no there's no arguing that sonically it would sound better because the recording yeah. is better. Absolutely, the songs sound better. So how how do you kind of balance that with the band? Because you, if you're a perfectionist, you could, could go on forever and never complete anything. Well, that's right, and I, I think I think what we've what we've tried to do is we do we rehearse a lot, we practice a lot because. We think that if we need to be able to put, perform these songs live um, to an ability where they're at least recognisable, so when you play performing them, people say, "Oh yeah, that sounds like that track." You know, it might not be exactly the same as on the record, but it'll be close enough, and people will to say, "Yeah, they can all play, they can sing in tune, they can, you know, rec they play the songs, they don't make mistakes." That's basically the level we're trying to get at when we perform live. But I, I think I think that's what we've learned along the way is that now we get to a place where. We, we record all of our rehearsals and um, we use them as references for when we come to places like this. So in our heads we're thinking, if they sound good in rehearsal, they're probably good enough to record. So we, we do try to get the performances to the level where we'd like to think if we were in the 60s, we could have pull it, pulled it off then. I mean, that, that's obviously not for us to, not, not I can't really, I mean, we're a bit too close to it, but if someone said to, said to us, came to us live and said like, oh yeah, you guys remind me of a band from the 60s, That'd be a huge compliment for us because that's actually what we're, you know, we, I think we'd like to, well, I think, we're, I think that's what we, that's our standard, if you like. We want to be able to, to cut it like those guys used to cut it back then. That's, that's what we're trying to achieve. So so in terms of what, what people record today, it's, it's all down to performances and, and ears. I, I still think you can't hide a shit performance. You can't polish a turd. People do try. Um, and also, um, you've got to have great ears. If you're, if you're like a mixing engineer, I've been on mixing courses. And I've learned a lot, you know, but learning to mix and get the levels right and the balance and the and how to, you know, balance all the instruments together and EQ them and all the rest of it. That's, that's like learning to play an instrument in itself. It takes years of practice. And I know enough to be able to m maybe make some suggestions, but Callum and Jimmy, they've 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 really done that work. They've they've spent years learning how to mix and produce and arrange and stuff. And I think we're so lucky to have those guys in the band because they got great ears and and I think we try really hard to give a good performance. I think that's, so we, I think, you know, the essence of the 60s and the retro stuff is definitely with us. We really want to aspire to be, be as good as those guys. That's what, we, that's what we'd love to do. But obviously that's not for us to say. It's for other people who come watch us and say, if someone says those guys sound like that, that's, that's, that's what we, you know, that's what we, that's what we want to do, isn't it? We want yeah. to try and achieve those standards. So. Yeah. What about with uh, like the music industry has changed so much in the last 20, 30 years? You know, uh, back when 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 I was younger, same as yourselves, um, you could walk into a music shop, and it might be that you you buy an album simply based on the album cover, and a lot of that lost nowadays because you've been streaming, downloading. Is artwork still important? 
Well, yeah, I'm sure I'm sure Dale's got an opinion on this, but just quickly, and I'll let you jump in. <laughs> We've been really surprised that people still buy CDs and vinyl, and and it's a lot more than we thought they would, and and that's been really encouraging. And so, yes, so artwork is important. But your yeah, I think day. people do still appreciate that physical product. Obviously, yeah. not in the same way, but they do like that tangible thing. And I think, I mean, the artwork thing still is really important. Um, at the moment, just because it's so needed, you know, in in every aspect of things that we're doing, like, you know, for the artwork on Spotify, for example, or, you know, you still need to have an artwork there for, for it to be related to the song. And, you know, all of the the press and the and the radio people, um, you know, they all want that stuff when, when you have new releases coming out, um, because it's just something for them to share and to, you know, pass on. And it kind of gives a bit of an idea of of what they're you know what they're sharing, um, yeah. and yeah, I think it does just give a bit of an idea of a vibe, uh, and you know an idea of the band. And I think that's something we've become more conscious of recently, yeah. because originally when we when we first started out, we were kind of being you know guided a little bit by other people yeah. um, because we didn't really know what direction to go in and, and everything, and we we were quite generic in the way mm. that we looked and and a little bit the way we sounded. Um, yeah. And we're sort of moving more into a direction of of our own at this point, and also I think the artwork and the the images, because you know everyone needs promo shots. Like everybody asks for them. Like you yeah. you, con- you get contacted by you know uh, a blog or or a news article or a you know magazine or or whatever, um, and they will ask you like what promo shots have you got? We need you know because everything's so visual now. But then. <laughs> saying that as well like videos are such a huge thing now you know yeah. um learning to do videos has been learning curve as well hasn't yeah it? so so I, I would still say that having artwork in that sense is massively important and but that, yeah but i think it's more than that now i mean as an artist we're an independent artist obviously we, we're ourselves but we i used to think oh if we if we learn all the songs and we record them well that'd be enough and that they'll take care of themselves but obviously We've learned that we've we've had to go on courses to learn how to market ourselves and promote ourselves. So now that we're doing the job of the record company and the artist and the and everything Promoters else, and the booking and, agents, yeah. everything. Basically, we've had to we're having to do it, find a way to do everything and the content. But now the content people, the extra level of that, it's just it's almost a full time job, isn't it? Yeah, it <laughs> it's is. Crazy. It's a it's multiple full time job, really. But there is something nice about that though, because I suppose you're in complete control of each aspect of the band well yeah yes and no i think in terms of we know where we want things to go but obviously the the barrier is obviously other people whether they'll be receptive to it or not and you have to constantly try things out and see what sticks i guess yeah we one of the issues is that you know we have to make connections with people um because we don't have well we didn't have any when we first started doing it um, yeah. You know, whereas other people who are more established, who might manage us or or take care of certain aspects of the business, they're going to have those contacts. Well, it's a um, bit. It's a bit like we we wanted to go on the support tour. We thought, well, that's a good idea. Let's go and support a big band. But we we but learned the hard way that actually a lot of those bands they you have to pay to support them in the first place, and secondly, you can't just pay them to support them. You've also got to they've also the band have to like you. They have to almost invite you on tour, and then you still have to pay them. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like unless sake. unless they really like you and they really like and they you. found your music yeah. and you know they're actually a fan themselves. Like, but yeah, even it then, does happen occasionally, doesn't it? Yeah, but I think even then, like, there's money to be made in that business, and yeah. they will charge people for those for those gigs. Yeah. So, um, so, so so I think what we're trying to do now is we're trying to build our own fan base and trying to sell sell our own tickets for gigs and stuff and. That's that's the that's difficult. It's a really difficult thing to sell tickets for gigs. Mm. It's uh, we managed to sell a few. Uh, we're starting to sell a few more tickets now for gigs, but it's it's taken a long time to actually get that momentum going and yeah. get enough. And not just to friends and family. We're starting to starting to sell tickets to people who like strangers we've never met before, which we yeah. feel is like which we feel is like is that's that's where you got to get to to have a yeah, chance. For sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So. so back in um, two thousand twenty three. You released your debut album. Uh, yeah. So it's got nine yeah. tracks on it. Yeah. yeah. I had a listen to the whole thing. <coughs> Excuse me. Nice. And uh, it has got a, a really unique sound to it, which is really good. Yep. But 
can hear lots of influences in there. So, but it, it's <laughs> it's a mishmash of everything. So I, I'd quickly jot it down. You know, who does this remind me of? But each track you go into, you get a little bit of something different, which is good though. But I've got down. You know, you've got obviously probably the Beatles. You've got the Beach Boys, but you've got stuff that's a bit more new, like Blur. You've got see a lot yeah. of the acoustic Oasis stuff. Yeah, so, yeah. Like but I even see even songs like um, you've got a song called uh, Understand. Yeah, that, mm. that, that, that had early Foo Fighters. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah, no, I, can, I can see what you mean. Yeah, it, it has a driving it's feel. To it. It's a little bit more upbeat, uh, but it, it was really it was really nice sounding. So I know that came out twenty twenty three this year. Um, you've had an EP, uh, Stay the Same. So I know Stay the Same was a new song, but you then took three of your songs from the debut album and converted them over into your, your acoustic format, but it worked brilliantly. Yeah. Oh, thank oh, you. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we spent a long time working on those songs. We had to rearrange them for for acoustic. That was the thing. Yeah. And I'm glad you picked up on that. Cause that's... Yeah, well, I mean, we chose ones that we think, you know, would thought would work best for that um, out from the album because the thing was is we didn't you know we we did have other songs we could have potentially used for an acoustic EP um, yeah. but uh, well, it, it, it was, was kind someone, of someone said to us we actually originally we did the acoustic EP because we wanted to get some live gigs and um, someone said advised us that if we did acoustic versions of album songs it, it, it would help us get maybe an acoustic support slot with a bigger band. That, that was the original idea. Yeah. But then we actually did it. We actually got a lot of, we were surprised. We really enjoyed yeah. it. And the thing is, yeah. um, the song Stay the Same was like an old favorite of ours, but it didn't really fit in with the rest of the material. So we yeah. kind of like left it behind. And then coming in to do the acoustic EP, we were like, well, that should be like on there. Um, so we brought that back and then we were, just we're absolutely overwhelmed by the response of that song. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen it online, but it's got an incredible reaction, that song. It's really mm. overwhelmed us. It's kind of made us think, well, should we do more stuff like that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there, is, there is something, me personally, I, I do like it when, like, I, I probably come from a rock, rock right, band. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. When you take a song and it, it can work in your full band on stage, you've got your martial art amps turned up, but then you can go and grab an acoustic guitar and sit down and the song works just as well. It's the sign of a good song when it can jump between both. Personally, that's what I think anyway. Yeah, well, mm. I think I think you're right because uh, there's been so many times when I've played, I've had a song on and I've tried to take it. That was a, that was a song by Pharrell Williams. Um, what was it? It was, uh, oh, that's, he did it with that band that was, um, you know, the Daft Punk. Daft Punk, yeah, it was uh, that track. Get lucky. Get lucky. Yeah. And that song's great on the record. It's like a really cool, dancey kind of tune. It's got the vibe and it's that sort of stuff. But when you take it down to a guitar, it's so much is lost. I don't know if you've experienced this. Some people can put it off and they can make a good version of it. They'll make it their own. But I've I've really struggled to get that song to be sound good just on the acoustic guitar and singing it. Hmm. I mean, some people probably can make it sound good, but if you just take it, lift it chord by chord, and, and just do it, it doesn't. It just it's doesn't just, translate. Yeah, it doesn't it translate is. brilliantly. Yeah. So. Sometimes you can you can reimagine a whole song though with yeah. it going at the rock indie yeah. rock setup to acoustic. It's almost like it's almost a wee challenge for yourselves. Can we actually make this work in an yeah. acoustic? <laughs> yeah, and it was it was good fun actually. It really, and I think it's something we're probably going to look into look to do again like maybe towards the end of this year or middle of, to the end of this year yeah cuz we have, we found there's actually we tapped into a market of um, i think they call it what the university of the third age is what it was described to me the other day <laughs> right. it's like older people who you were like really into who were, who were there when the beatles and the kinks were and all that sort of bands and first time they there's there's a, a lot of people in that age group who love that sound yeah and, and they're they, still really passionate about it yeah as well. so, we, so we might have to do another few tracks for those guys yeah i think we've <laughs> we found an appetite for it out there and yeah. i think we probably will do it again but we so, yeah oh, oh, you go. i was just gonna say i might be uh stepping on your toes but we do have you know this the the second album is is like a full rock album yeah. so yeah it's rock. um you know, you'll you'll hopefully we're, we're really that. really excited about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I was going to say to you, but we're we're quite early on in 2024, so I've already had a wee look in your your 
your um, on your website. So you have got gigs almost every month right through to December. So you, mm. these are constantly playing. But am I right in saying the big thing this year is getting the second album complete? Yeah, prob- pretty much. Well, I mean, yeah, doing well, that and then also recording the third album is definitely. I think. I think we're. Stuff. Yeah, we're we're really we're really going to be um, pushing the marketing this year. We're really going to try and um, maximise uh, the opportunities that we can to try and get fans on board. Because we we've brought that that it's it's one of those things where if you try and gig too often and too soon, you'll end up being very disappointed when no one's going to turn up or very few people turn up. And once you've exhausted your friends and family, you might be the best band in the world, but if no one's ever heard of you or not enough people have heard of you you will be playing to an empty audience and and or just the bar staff and the guy at the door yeah. and we, we want to try and move away from that so we're going to focus really hard on trying to build our audiences up in certain areas before we try and do a gig there and that's mm-hmm. that's one thing that we're going to try a bit do a bit better this year I think, I, I think it's a bit of a cop out so I apologize but I think we don't really like we have so much going on we're kind yeah. of attacking everything from from every angle like we're doing you know new music we're doing rock stuff and we're probably going to do acoustic stuff um we're recording new stuff um you know we're we're doing lots of more videos like short form content and like music videos we're doing the marketing stuff we're doing more merch as well and um and actually producing the cds and the vinyl and stuff like that um we're getting out there and we're gigging um (laughs) so it's kind of like we're just i don't know we're probably going to burn out but we're, we're trying to do it all i think yeah. And I, I am driving my wife mad at the moment. <laughs> yeah. But I do think I do think the two biggest things this year are being here right now and recording the the, yeah. the third we're, album. We're really enjoying this experience. Yeah. This is like a holiday for me because I, <laughs> I had a kid about he's like nineteen months old. So to get away for a week, it's just like it's got me to a lot of trouble, but it's been worth it. I tell yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. okay, we have been pretty serious talking about lots of nice important things. So we're going <laughs> yeah. to one a few fun questions for you. Okay. Go for it. So, first of all, uh, Dale, you're on drums. Is there another instrument that you wish that you could play? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm kind of like a... Bagpipes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got me. No, um, I, I'm a bit of like um, uh, like a tortured front man in some ways, I think. You're the back man. I, I like, I think that I, I really enjoy singing. I'm not the best at it, but I love you're it. You're good, man. You're and I, with with some of my other bands, I, I play with a couple of other bands. Um, le- you know, less full on as this, but um, you know, and I'll sing lead. You know, if we do some covers and stuff, yeah. um, sometimes, um, which I really enjoy. And I do, you know, it's like stuff like this. Like I, I'm quite happy to get involved with like yeah. interviews and stuff. Um, and I and I quite like chatting on stage. I can't help myself. I have a mic in front of me, so I'm just going to start talking. Um, so I think that's one thing. But I, yeah, instrument wise, like I love piano, and I did. I have tried to learn a few times, but never quite got it to that next level. But maybe what about you? me. Um, well, I play guitar and sing, but I also play another instrument. Yeah, with piano as well. Like, I think there's um, there's stuff on the piano that you can do that you can't do on the guitar. So mm. and that. And I, and I think it'd be great for learning to, to probably improve my songwriting if I spend a bit of time learning yeah. playing piano. Right. So, Chris was playing the drums earlier as well. <laughs> Shut up. He was, he, was like, he was like, I can play that song that you just played. I was taking the piss. Really. <laughs> so, imagine imagine uh, Doc Brown drives up in his DeLorean yeah. and, he's, and he says to each of you, we're allowed to go back in time and you can go and attend one concert from the past. <laughs> What concert would each of you want to attend? Oh God! Um, I mean, Live Aid immediately comes. You to, go to Live Aid. I mean, that it? immediately comes to that's yeah, to really my mind. interesting. Um, I think that's got to be one of the most iconic gigs of all time, right? Um, you're not at the back. <laughs> <laughs> There's one gig that I didn't go to, and I re- I regretted it ever since, and um, it was. When I was when I was a, a like a student in Canterbury, Radiohead had 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 just released Pablo Honey at the time, yep. and um, they were playing at a local place called the Penny Theatre in Canterbury, and and I never went to that gig, and they they blew up overnight uh, after that, and I and everyone told me what a great gig it was, and I wish I'd gone to that gig. That's that's the one, that small club. There's about 100 people there, very intimate. I think I'd love to have been at that gig. So. Right. See if you could get one. 
Well, well, we'll make it two. See if you could get two famous other two famous musicians to come and jam on one of your songs. Oh. Who would mm. you want? Um, oh. I mean, it would be nice because I don't really want to replace anyone in the band, right? So yeah, it'd be yeah. nice to either like maybe if you could do like a duet with someone, mm, or well. or if we could get like another instrument that would would fit in with us. Um, right, there's there's one guy. Oh, actually, I did meet him once, and that was really cool. Yeah, he's a singer from a band called Kent. I can't remember his name. It's just, they're from Sweden. They're, they've split up now, but they they were massive over there. They were huge, and I love their songwriting. And I love what's his name? It's Joachim, I think his name is. What's his? Oh. I can't remember his name, it's a Swedish name, and I wish I could remember. But he's like, he's, he's, the way he writes his songs, I've, I find it very inspiring. I'd love to, I'd love to jam with him, it'd be amazing. Mm. Yeah. I think one, th one element that we're missing in the band is like a uh, piano or, or keyboard player, or like mm. sort of th synthesizer player. I think it'd be really cool to have someone like that. I'm not really, I mean, Stevie Wonder maybe? <laughs> like he, play, he plays all those yeah, stuff, but yeah. it'd be amazing. But, I mean, that's not really the, our vibe, but it'd be really cool. He would, he would, I'm sure he'd bring a really cool dynamic to yeah. the tunes. Yeah. He, he would certainly introduce something different. And then the, the last last question for both of you. Yeah. Mount Rushmore, who is the four <laughs> bands or artists for each of you um, that they are just perfection for, for yourselves, whether it be songwriting, whether it be performance, whether it be the overall package. For each of you, who are the four bands or artists that you just put at the top of your pile in no particular order. That's really interesting. Um, mm. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's... Oh. It's almost like I don't want to forget anyone. I think I think you're talking about moments, aren't you, in time. I think there are certain... Bands tend to have their day, don't they? Their moment when they're really great, they're prolific, and, and, they're start, and they can't do anything wrong. And I guess, you know, there's some obvious, obvious ones, but I don't know if I'll commit to them but like there was Oasis in the 90s obviously they had their, their moment where they were just, they couldn't do anything wrong for a, a long time they were just doing some great stuff um, I guess there was also Radiohead around the same time they were doing some great stuff at that, around that time and I think before then obviously the Beatles obviously and Beach Boys but not Beach Boys weren't always consistent I think when Brian Litt Wilson wasn't so involved with them they when he started to go, go a bit nuts he, the band just sort of weren't the same so Allegedly. Allegedly, yeah. <laughs> you have to, like, just in case. And I don't know, there's so many, aren't there? It's really difficult to say. David Bowie, again, he's a great yeah. artist. Uh, I, I'd probably go with, it's like, yeah, just really, just ones that mean a lot and have always stuck with me. Um, like, probably Rage Queen. Against the Machine. Queen. I mean, I would, I'd probably go for more, like my teenage years, the, those formative years were just really yeah. important. I think... Um, yeah, Rage Against the Machine, System of a Down, My Chemical Romance, probably. <clears throat> and then, yeah, maybe Fall Out Boy. I'd probably yeah. go with it. Yeah, yours. Yeah, I, I guess I'm more of a traditional songwriter kind of guy. I've got, like, I, I guess Stone Roses as well. They had that moment, they were great. Um, Smiths. There's some, there's some great bands over the years. It's very difficult just to say I'll, I'll choose four. Um, just do it quick. All right. Okay. Well, Beatles, obviously. Okay. Beatles, they're Beatles, and probably some of the Beach Boys, and probably have to go for Oasis as well because they're just great at that moment. Mm -hmm. And the fourth band, surely Ken. Well, it would be Kent for me, but no one knows who they no, are. No, but that's, it's, say, you, yeah. it's for you. Kent, Kent from Sweden. Yeah. 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 My, my rule really selfish. So. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Chris, Dale, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you for us. Really look forward to hearing. Uh, the future music that you've got coming out and obviously if he's ever up this neck of the woods on <laughs> tour certainly give me a wee shit and I will come along and uh, oh, really? be, Wait, where's, your nearest, just, where's the nearest town to you? I'm right between Glasgow and Edinburgh alright oh, okay, okay cool cool. okay so, so definitely if, possible if you're supporting the, if, if you're um, if you're playing the band bands or that I'll be there <laughs> great <laughs> well We'll definitely let you know. Yeah. <laughs> be cool. Yeah. I'll keep an eye on things and thank you so much for coming on. Chris, I hope Thanks you feel so you really enjoyed Thanks the chat lot. actually. It's gone really quickly. I thought it was gonna <laughs> Yeah, yeah. it's great. Yeah, nice. Great one. questions. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye, guys, see you later on. Take see you care. Soon. Cheers.